Well, church, listen, enough of that. Let's all stand, if you would. (laughs) Open up our Bibles this morning to Romans chapter 8. Romans 8. In our scripture reading together, we're in a new section of scripture, which means a whole new title, whole new focus. In this section, Paul will do uh, some restructuring, as it were. He's going to visit a little bit, almost verbatim. He'll repeat uh, Romans 5 a little bit, sections of that, and then he'll launch on and do an incredibly deep reality that we have as believers (laughs) And soon you're going to be hearing a lot about this thing of adoption. What God has chosen to do in your life, you're going to wind up over the course of the next, I don't know, I'd say four weeks. Your life, I told you at the beginning of the book of Romans, your life will be transformed if you stick with this book. And this is a tremendous reading right here together. So I'm going to ask you, to look at it with me together, and we're looking at Romans chapter 8, beginning at verse 12, down to verse 17. I'll pick the even, if you'll take the odd-numbered verses together. He says, therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For as many, listen everybody, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. Verse 16, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Father, we pray, Lord, in Jesus' name that today's word would find a home in our hearts. God, that not just stay there, though, but God, it would emanate to our minds and our mouths, our thinking, our thought process, what we see. And Lord, down to the bottom of our feet, that we would literally get up and go. Being a brand new person, brand new creation, possessed by the Holy Spirit as we've been learning children of God. So Father, we pray for your anointing now, both for us to proclaim and for us to do your word. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen. Amen. You may be seated, everybody. So we're looking now at this mini-series in this section. I know it's just several verses, but it's extremely deep, as is the entire book of Romans, which is um, uh, Paul's, Paul's most comprehensive epistle that he wrote. Now, I I hesitate because I personally believe, it's irrelevant, but I personally believe that Paul wrote the book of Hebrews. I can't prove it. The book of Hebrews is not, uh, doesn't give authorship, but it's very, what's known as Pauline in his arguments. But the book of Romans is deep. There's just no getting around it. And um, do some of you remember, are you still here when, as the church opened up and, uh, We were coming together. People began to come from other churches. Their churches had been closed. And the the place was just packed out every service and just crazy. And that's fine. And then for me, quickly, it became not fine. And this is the reason why. I was meeting people in the front, in the foyer, and in the courtyard who were saying to me, oh, I'm here from XYZ Church. Our church hasn't opened its doors. We've come here. And so, oh, it's nice to meet you. We exchange names. But then I begin to hear the questions that they were asking me, or you were asking me. I'll put that in a genetic sense. That, is it, you said that Jesus is actually going to return to earth? Is the second coming? See, we've always been taught that the second coming is not actually real. It's a metaphorical event. And I, exactly, my, my heart sunk. And I'm not joking when I tell you this. I honestly had this thought. Wait, we've been laying the foundation for 30 years as a church. And then COVID hits. 
and we adopt a whole bunch of people, or we became a foster church, <laughs> and we're starting all over because these people don't know the basics. And it shocked me. And if you remember, if you were here that time, I said, stop. We're stopping what we're doing. We were in a particular series at that time. And I said, stop. We're stopping. We're going on Sundays. We're starting in the book of Romans on Sunday. And we're going to do Hebrews on Wednesday. And why? The two deep treaties. Why? Because numbers quickly became very clear to me not to be important. It didn't matter how many people were here. It mattered if they were true disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what mattered. And I got to tell you, it was such a, such a thing. And now we're years into this, and we're in chapter 8, so we're moving. Hey, we're, it's better on Sundays than it has been on Wednesdays. I think we're in chapter 5, 6 still, chapter 6. But uh, listen, you guys, biblical Christianity, uh, and for that matter, the entire Bible itself, is all about God communicating to you and I his desire, amen. listen, for you to be liberated. Yes, amen. That's right. And studying this, I've become convinced that very few of us, I'm wondering if at all any of us, to the depth that God would want, have we been liberated? Can you say, don't, don't speak out loud, can you say today, I'm living the victorious Christian life. When I see my life being lived, and when I read the Bible, and when I look at the New Testament, that's the life I'm living. You say, Jack, that's a tall order. No, you know what? That's a normal order. That's exactly what he's been telling us. That we, as people of God, we are to be so radically different in this world that is around us. That when God is moving through us, and we're going to talk about this today. When God is moving through us, the world should actually either A, hate us for what we have. Or B, come running and grabbing us saying, what must I do to be saved? Like you, what do I need to do? Who's this God of yours? That's what must happen. And it will happen. If we are led by the Spirit of God, not by ourselves, not by any man, any group, any movement, anything, it's got to be of God. God, listen, is the one who has chosen to communicate his love and his salvation to us. No one made up the Bible. You got to, for those of you who are skeptics, oh, I, men wrote the Bible. Have you ever heard people say that? The Bible is written by a bunch of men. Excuse me, have you taken the time? To actually read, if that's your approach, to read what those men wrote, they threw themselves under the bus. They told themselves that they were going to hell. They told themselves that God is holy and man is not. Think about it. If you think of, that the Bible is a plot by man, then wow. Because the Bible reveals, the Bible pulls the mask off of who we really are, no man could know that, and then go, goes through a chronological event of either a nation's life, Israel, or people's lives. You think Abraham wrote about Abraham? If he did, Abraham didn't have much self-esteem because he threw himself under the bus. Are you with me? The Bible, it says of itself, it is written by God who possessed men by the Holy Spirit, and they were moved by the Spirit as the Word of God went out. And that's a huge statement. That's a huge statement. We have to admit that. But can you prove it? And the answer to that is absolutely yes. You can prove it. Especially, listen, as more time goes on, the Bible, listen, we get deeper into the Bible. Every single thing from Genesis 1, 1, all the way through has proven to be exactly true. What an incredible God we have. Liberty. He wants us to be liberated. And now Paul in chapter 8 is going for this entire argument that there's a liberty that can only come from being right with God. And there's a type of, listen, the liberty that God offers is a submission to him. You say, Jack, that sounds very cynical. That sounds like a God that is insecure. That sounds like a God that's weird. Wait a minute. In this world, right here, right now, every single one of us are committed to something. Which makes us either a slave of something bad, or, if it's Jesus, a slave of someone good. 
Whoever you yield yourself to, that's the power that controls your life. Whatever it might be. And so there was a man, we mentioned him last week together, I think. You know, listen, it's tough for me to remember because all three services, they're all different. So I mentioned the man Abraham Lincoln, and I want to mention him again. Because regarding this issue of liberty, did you know that the liberty that he wanted for this nation, which was according to the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, he believed in it so much that he actually believed so radical a thought that that should apply to every human being in America, no matter what their color, no matter what their status. Think about that for a moment. And listen, Abraham Lincoln, a white guy, stood for the black guy, and it cost him his life. If you know the story, John Wilkes Booth and all of that stuff, they killed him because Lincoln believed liberty was something that man could not have a corner market on. It was something given by God, and it was our responsibility as humans to make sure that every human being within our power lived free. And and that, that biblical belief got him killed. And I want you to think about God's love for you and setting you free. It cost him his life. Did it not? In fact, I want to show you the Emancipation Proclamation. Just, uh, that's the, that's actually uh, a copy of the original. But I want to read just something to you. Emancipation Proclamation in 1863. On January 1st, 1863, President Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation announcing that all persons held as slaves within the rebellious areas are and henceforward shall be free. Although the Emancipation Proclamation did not end slavery in the nation, it did fundamentally begin a transformation of the character of the war. After January 1st, 1863, every advance of the federal troops expanded the dominion or domain of freedom. I love that. Think about your Christian life. Wherever you and I go, we should expand the domain of freedom as believers. The promises given by Abraham, President Abraham Lincoln to provide such a freedom would be solely based upon the victory of the Union military forces by nothing less than achieving total victory. That's inscribed at the National Archives. You and I are about to walk on holy ground on this portion of the book of Romans. It's absolutely awesome. And listen, if I say something today, if it's of me, you can forget about it. But if it's from God, hang on to it. But if you would, mark this down in your note-taking. You can forget everything, but don't forget this. There are four basic arguments that are going to be before us during this section that we study in these next few weeks. Number one is this. Is our being led by the Holy Spirit? First, are we being led by the Holy Spirit? Write that down. I don't think you're going to see it on the screen. Just write it down. How do you know that you're a child of God? Do you want to prove it to yourself? Ask yourself this question. Number one is, are you being led by the Spirit of God? Ask yourself that question. Number two, is the spirit of adoption within us or within you crying out, Abba, Father, we read it a moment ago. Do you want to draw closer to God? Don't answer out loud. Just answer it on a piece of paper. These are things that must be proven in your life. This is a diagnostic test for all of us as a church. Am I being led by the Spirit? In other words, do you sense the Spirit of God leading you, frankly, on a daily basis? And here's the scary thing about what I just said. If I have to explain it to you, the answer is no for you. Do you have a desire to call him father? Listen, if you're Jewish right now, you're offended by what I just said. You'll never hear in the Old Testament scriptures the Jew being invited to call God father. Because we say the word father, but you read it a moment ago, it's the word Abba, that's Aramaic. I like it in Italian. The Aramaic word in Italian is Papa. The Bible is telling us, Jesus said it himself, when addressing the Father, he called him Papa. Can you inside say, yes, when I speak to him, when I call out to him, 
I have that desire, and he's Papa. Now, some legalist, is gonna, they're going to say, oh, that's so irreverent. Well, you need to read your Bible. Is it possible that God would want us to have a relationship with him so close? Oh, yes. Thirdly, is the witness of the Holy Spirit happening to our spirit? Third thing, is the, is the witness of the Holy Spirit speaking to your internal spirit? We're going to find out how in the, starting today in the next few weeks. Fourthly, and finally, it's this, is that the result of being spiritual aliens, as it were, in this world, can we agree with the Bible that because we follow Jesus, there's a sense of suffering in our lives? Are we in any way, shape, or form suffering for the name of Christ? Now, this is not a weird statement, and I don't want to bum you out. It means this, guilty by association. Your mom and dad told you, be careful who you hang out with. You might say, well, I was never like my friends. Well, you, that's amazing. Usually birds of a feather get in trouble together. No, I'm kidding, but you had it right. I just changed it just now. But it's true, you know. And so the fact of the matter is, regarding you and I knowing Christ, are we the only ones who know that we know Christ? In other words, do you know that I know Christ? You say, Jack, yeah, you talk about him every week. Uh, yeah, I make that assumption. Sure, I get it, I get it. But does the world know that Jack belongs to Christ? Does your world know that you belong to Christ? The moment they do, there is a beautiful, wonderful, holy, appointed suffering. People are going to not invite you because you're a Christian. They're going to exclude you because you're a Christian. Whatever it might be. So church, let's dive into this together. The, the title for this uh, series is, It's Time You Quit. How's that? Just quit. So, well, pastor, I was thinking about that today. That's why I came to church. I'm just about ready to end it all. God! Maybe it's time you just absolutely quit, because that's what God wants us to do, is to absolutely quit doing it on our own and to wake up to the realization that we belong to his family and when you're in the family of God, there is nothing, listen carefully, there is nothing that you do to put you in that family and keep you in that family. This is going to be some challenges to our legalism today. We are, listen, we are no longer obligated to rules and regulations. Hang on. We are no longer obligated to do anything for God. Listen. Obliga Did God ever say, you do this and I'll love you? No. You do these five things or these ten things and I will approve of you. No. We are not obligated to do anything for God. Number one, he doesn't need us. So, Pastor, what do you mean he doesn't need us? He doesn't need you. He doesn't need me. He lets us get involved with what he's doing. Amen. It's like your two-year-old wanting to mow the lawn with you. <laughs> it's the worst thing ever if you want to get the job done, but it's the most beautiful thing for a photo moment or remembering, oh my gosh, because here's what God says to mom and dad trying to mow the lawn with a two-year-old who wants to mow, they want to push the lawnmower is... It's going to take me forever. And then God says to you, that's exactly, that's exactly what you're causing me to do with your life. <laughs> we, Jack, we could go from, from zero to 100 in a second if you would just stop trying to mow the lawn and let me do it, Jack. Just hang on. Or better yet, I'll hold you. I'll carry you. By the way, it just reminds me, I have a picture of mowing our lawn and there's one with Ashley trying to mow the lawn at two years of age. I can see her now, which she's the, she is the brunt of my illustration. I can see her in my head. And then Lisa got one of those um, backpack things for kids in those days. And you put them on and you put the kid in the back. And she would stand up and look over my shoulder as I mowed the lawn. And we got a bunch of pictures like that. Listen, in both cases, the lawn got mowed. One took two hours. The other one took about 30 minutes. But she experienced it all. Are you with me? 
It was a relationship together. And this is vitally important. It may sound crazy to you for me to say, you are not obligated to do anything for God. But, read the fine print, you are now, church, obligated to God. That's far broader. That's much deeper. And so we note this in verses 12 to 14. It's time you quit. Don't just do something. Stand there. Don't just do something. Stand there. God might be speaking to some of you today saying, I just want you to stop. And just stand there. And let my truth wash over you. You need to hear this so that you might be liberated. And the first thing is this. Stand in his debt. Can you write that down? Stand in his debt. The word debt, like financial debt. Or when you're indebted to somebody. Stand in his debt. Watch this. Verse 12 says, therefore. Circle the word therefore. Very important. Very key point. J. Vernon McGee would say, that's why it's there for. <laughs> therefore. We are debtors, circle the word debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh, verse 13, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. We already know this as believers. If we live according to the flesh, it's going to kill us. It's, it's hard, listen, our flesh wants to do its own thing, but it's hard to live like that. Before you were a Christian, you survived, maybe you didn't, weekends, it was probably better for you to go back to work on Monday because you didn't treat yourself well during the weekend. What was going on? Your flesh was in control, right? And all of that sinning and living for self and, oh, I want this, and at your expense, I'm going to have it. Leads to death, the Bible says. And we become indebted to sin. We become indebted to our passions. But there's an indebting that is holy and pure. And that is to stand in his debt. What do I mean by that is understanding this. Mark it down if you would. The word debtors is a, a, a word in meaning both, listen, in Greek or in English, it's, it's uh, colorful. But look at the Greek meaning of the word debtors. This is what Paul is saying. This is what you need to do. Not in the flesh, no more, but to God. It means in the negative, we are culprits together. <laughs> Because it's plural, debtors. It's not, I'm a debtor. It's that we were all once children, the Bible says. Listen to this. Um, again, why would man write this if man wrote the Bible? We were once all children of the devil. How's that for a strong cup of coffee this morning? That's plurality. We were all in debt to the things of the world. We were culprits together in living out fleshly appetites. In the positive, meaning this, being a debtor to or indebted to, owned by or under the obligation of another. Do you see the difference? Listen, you don't, you don't do anything for God to earn his acceptance. Because of what he's done for you and I, we are now indebtors to God because of his great love wherewith he's loved you. What he has done causes us not to be grabbed by the ear or twisted, not to be grabbed by the neck and drugged to church and you sit down and you learn this. No, listen. <laughs> the world is probably more full of people like that, tragically maybe by ignorance, than by what God would have. And that is, I can't wait. Watch, I can't wait to meet up with God's people. I can't wait to worship like we did a moment ago. I can't wait to break open the Bible. I can't wait to find out what God might say next in the message. I can't wait to see what God's going to do this week in my life. Listen, when that is in your life, that means the Holy Spirit is in control. He's leading. And why is that true? Because you are now indebted to him. You didn't even know that. You want to know why? You are set free by his salvation, which brings you into debt to his love. You know this on, a, on an earthly plane when you're in love. Listen, when you're in love and your, your f girlfriend or your fiance, she, she says, you know, um, I would sure, I'd love to have, I don't know. I would love to have a, a fish taco. Uh, <laughs> you know, and I know the stores are probably closed. Listen, 
What do you do when you hear your sweetheart say that? Oh man, you're looking, you're calling. Are you guys open? Can you stay open? I'll pay you 20 bucks extra if you just stay open. Why would, you wouldn't do that for you. You wouldn't do it for any of your friends. You wouldn't do it for anybody else on the planet. But listen, because she wants it, you love her. And so you'll bribe the store owner, keep it open 20 bucks. I'll be there, I'm on my way. And you'll go through that for her. And that is true on both sides of the equation regarding God's love for you. He did it all. And our love for him now. That love displayed to us. Remember the Bible says, listen, we did not first love him. He loved us first. He first loved us. That's how we are able to love him. I, you, don't, don't, you don't work, oh, I, got, I got to do this. What are you going to do? I've got to, I got to get some more love going in my heart for God. Every single one of us are in some way ashamed to say we love God. Because why? The moment we say it, we know how bankrupt we are in saying it. Yeah. It's not enough. We want to say, I love you, God, and bring in a bouquet of flowers. I want to say, I love you, God, and bring in gifts, right? The only way we can do that rightly is say, God, I love you. I quit. I quit all the stuff of me trying to impress you. I quit all the stuff with me trying to earn your favor. I quit doubting your love for me. I, God, believe exactly what your word says, that you love me. And he, listen, he doesn't love us because he looked down from heaven and saw something in us and said, mm, my, my, heaven would be so much better if Jack were here. No, that's false doctrine. Listen, I'm speaking about people who are on so-called Christian TV right now, if you're catching this. God more accurately looked over a cloud, so to speak, and said, man, are those people messed up and they're doomed for hell. If I don't rescue them, that's exactly where they're going. And he stepped off of his throne and he took on human skin. Absolutely epic. Remarkable. So as we look at this, we, God is calling us to stand in this liberty. And to do that is to stand in debt to him. I, you, we owe God everything. Amen. It's awesome. Listen to this. I'm gonna, it's quite a read. We've got a chunk of scripture here. But listen about uh, you and I being emancipated, set free. Galatians 5 verse 13. We'll start there. For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh. Wow, I'm a Christian now. I can smoke pot. (laughs) Really? I'm a Christian now. I can do anything I want. Really? How about getting a heart transplant? Because when you become a Christian, you only want to do those things that please God. It doesn't mean we're sinless, because you know the battle. I still want to do some things that I'm not supposed to do. And God says, don't do that. And I say, but I want to. And then he says, you're not, don't do that. And here's the part that kills me. When God says this, I don't know if he says this to you or not, but he says this to me, Jack, you have the license. You can, you can grab the license to do whatever you want to do, but it's not good for you. Listen, Jack, I'm going to love you no matter what you do. But because I love you, I'm asking you to do what I say to do. And then I have to drop the weapons, step back and say, how do, God, how do I wrestle with you like this? How do I, how do you and I get in an argument? Every argument we get in, I lose every time because of your sweetness, because of your kindness. He doesn't wallop me on the head with a hammer. That's the God of religion. No. No. My flesh is the problem. But through love, serve one another. Isn't that amazing? Every single one of us are commanded to serve one another. Why? Because that's the nature of God. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, words, beware lest you be consumed by one another. Oh. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are these which are adultery, fornication. Adultery is having sex and one outside of marriage. Somebody, one's single, the other one's married, or both are married, but not to each other. Fornication, 
is sexual in, uh, in, immorality. So that would be two single people having sex together. That word pornea also includes pornography, anything else. Uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, the worship of things, sorcery, hallucinogenic drugs, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, wow, you gotta take a shower after you read this, <laughs> murders, drunkenness, revelries is another word for orgies, and the like. <laughs> Paul throws that in, in case I missed something. Of which I tell you beforehand, just as I t- also told you in time past, that those who practice, the word practice means those who live this life will not inherit the kingdom of God. Crystal clear. Why? What, why is he saying this? Because he's talking about people who don't have the nature of God. They don't have that hunger for the word. They don't have that hunger to worship. They don't come from hungry and... B- uh, bellflower <laughs> to church. They don't care about that. They have no desire to read the Bible whatsoever. There's nothing driving them to say, what is God saying today? <laughs> Look, it's awesome for us because we know this, this spirit of God in us. It doesn't make us arrogant. doesn't make us better than anybody else. In fact, it does the opposite, doesn't he? When we realize how much he's got a hold of us, we're pretty much gutted. Which, by the way, the list of people I just read about, that list should break your heart, Christian. Because you and I used to be in that group. And there's people that you and I know, and we might even be married to that person. And it kills us because you'll, you'll be the one who'll say, Pastor Jack, you're always talking about Jesus coming back and you hope it's today, but my husband's not saved. And I know that heart. Of course I get that. I understand that. God knows all things. Don't worry about the timing. But your heart's broken because they, you love them, but they are not in the family. But you want them to be. Isn't that amazing? Friend, listen, if I'm speaking to you and you're not a Christian, don't you think it's rather bizarre that people who are going to heaven and they know it, they're not happy. Because you're not going with them. Did you know that we're more concerned about your eternal soul than you are? Why is that? Because we love others like we love ourselves. We're going to heaven, but we're not content until you're with us. You say, what does that mean? What if they don't make it? Are we going to be moping around up in heaven? No, guess what? You will have no memory of that individual in heaven. Why? They were never born. They were never born again. They never made it into the family. That ought to make you, your heart even more heavy, right? Galatians 5, look at verse 16 through 18. I say then, walk in the spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. See the practicality of that? It means this, the lust of the flesh is constantly pounding on the believer's head just like it is in anybody else. But the believer is fighting that. Non-believers don't have a fight. They're suckers. There's no liberty for them. They've got no liberty. This temptation comes by, they grab onto it, and they go, and they're enslaved to it. They can't even say no. They're given over. We all know what that's like. We used to live like that. For the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary to one another. Oil and water. For that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Why does the Bible say that? Ten commandments, the commandments of the church, the commandments of the fathers, the commandments of the... Oh, stop it. You can't keep the commandments. Nobody can. God gave the Ten Commandments to show us his righteousness and how we ought to treat one another. And the first thing we realize to the Ten Commandments is that we don't love God as we ought and we don't treat people as we ought. That's why God says in the day that you wake up to the fact that you've sinned against my Ten Commandments, you need to offer innocent blood for the atonement of your souls. The answer is Jesus. But just note this. This is very powerful and it's liberating. And I realize, listen, as I'm reading this, the only people in this room right now are those that are watching right now. The only ones that have a frown on their face are those who are not liberated. Because they're hearing this and they're going, I don't like that. 
Why? We love it. What's the difference? A big difference. And it has nothing to do with us. We're indebted to him because of what he's done. You can have it too, by the way. You can be indebted. Don't you want to add some new debt onto your life? How about his debt? You'll never have to pay back. You will eternally be so indebted to him that you will forever be with him in worship in heaven forever. Amen. But verse 22, but the fruit of the spirit is love. By the way, if you're a student of the Bible, the fruit of the spirit is only one thing and one thing only. It's not the other things. It's one thing. Notice it says, but the fruit singular. It's not the fruits. <laughs> it's the fruit of the spirit is love. Period. In the English, it's got a comma, and it suggests that the fruit of the Spirit is joy. The fruit of the Spirit is peace. You see where I'm going? No, no, it's this. The fruit of the Spirit is love. And when you have God's love, and that relationship is two ways between you and him and he to you, you are walking with him in love. And guess what? You You cannot but have joy. When you realize this theological fact, you cannot but have peace. Look, you can't have the fruit of the Spirit, which is the love of God, and have no joy. That doesn't work. Are you with me? Oh, you know, I I have the fruit of the Spirit. I've got love. Uh, I've got kindness. Mm, My faithfulness is questionable. (laughs) You see how funny that is? Listen, it's the love of God and his love for us, the spirit dwelling in our lives, results in joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness. You don't muster these. You don't take a course for this. Goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such, there's no law. Why is there no law regarding these things? Because it's not done by us. A law, a rule wouldn't apply. Are you guys with me? A, 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 A law doesn't work. That means if it's a law, then you're responsible. God has to do it. The Ten Commandments is a law, but God has to do it. It's got to be of the Spirit of God. This is liberating. One more. Galatians 5, verse 24. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions. So you know those passions? You know how they pop up? Passions pop up. They start in your head. One little spark. And don't, don't, don't look so innocent. The Bible teaches that Satan attacks every one of us and he shoots thoughts. They're called fiery darts. <laughs> he shoots them at you. Now, I don't believe Satan knows our thoughts. I don't believe that. I don't, some people teach that. I don't believe Satan can know your thoughts. I just think that he and his, de- and his demons have been around a long time. We're probably really predictable And they know when to launch their attack. I don't think they can read our minds. I don't buy that one bit as a believer. So what Satan does is he knows just at the right time. And if you think I'm joshing with you and fooling with you, you can just make an appointment that you are going to, you're going to pray today at two o'clock. You're going to get on your knees and you're going to pray. And listen, he goes, oh yeah, really? He dips this one arrow in, um, in a hunger thought, hungry. You could, just, you could have just got done eating. And he'll go, and you'll have this thought. Ah, oh, I think I'm hungry. But I was going to pray. But Deuteronomy 8 verse 10 does say, after you have eaten, give God thanks. So maybe that's what I'll do. You could say, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to tell one person about Jesus once a day. Here comes the arrow. And you, you say, well, Jack, you're not encouraging me because I don't want to get shot at. <laughs> you're getting shot. Listen, I, I can't explain this, but it's way better to be in the relationship and in the war and in the battle and get shot at than to be on the sidelines where nothing's happening. Right. You want to see the power of God happen? You got to get yourself out there. Right. You got to get out there. There's people today, a lot of young people, uh, I, I, I don't want to ask anybody out. Guys, young guys today, men, men, young men, I'm talking to you. Well, she's, she's really cute, but I, I can't ask her out. 
Why can't you? You have a mouth. Go over there. Well, you can't do that. Why not? I'm scared. Get over it. No, seriously, right? Get over it. Look, if you don't, someone else is going to go over to her. How do you know God's not saying, hey, hey, bozo, that's the one. That's her. She's for you. And you're like, oh, I don't know. You got to take a step. Is it terrifying? Of course it is. You got to step out. And well, I just want to be a spectator Christian. You know what? It is so boring. And you'll never see the power of God's word happen. You'll never see the spirit of God move in your life in a way where you can't explain what just happened. So stay on the sidelines. It's horrible. No, I'm talking about quitting all of that. It's time to quit that. And become indebted to him. And boy, I tell you, when he takes control, listen, when you, watch, when he takes control, when you submit to him, when you yield, you are free. You are absolutely liberated. And I know what I'm saying is spiritual truth. And the natural man, the Bible says, cannot understand this. There's people sitting here or watching right now saying, this guy's nuts. He's nuts what he's saying. He's saying that to be free, you got to become a a slave to God. Yes, that's exactly what I'm saying. Hmm. Didn't Jesus say, if you want to find your life, lose it. Give up your earthly practice of even religion and find a relationship with Jesus Christ by faith in him and love. That's God's will for your life. What's God's will for my life? That's it. Become indebted to him. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, be imitators of God. Be imitators of God. The word, we get the word mimic. Or to mime. As dear children, and walk in love, as Christ also has loved us. There it is. And given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. Did you know that Jesus is sacrifice of obedience to the Father is a sweet smell to the Father. That's when Jesus was on earth, and I'm sure it's still true to the second. And we're supposed to mimic him so that when you and I live our lives, we are to be not smelly, but we are to have an aroma. We're not to have a stink. We are to have a fragrance. (laughs) The Bible says that when brothers and sisters are communing with one another, we are a fragrance one toward another. But, listen, the Bible also tells us that we as believers, to those who don't know Christ, we are the stench of death to them. Why? Because we remind them that, number one, we were once like they are now, but we announce to them by a new life that they don't have to stay the way that they are. That's why I think real true Christianity is under attack today in this world is because just your changed life and your testimony suggests that people can be changed and the world doesn't want to hear that. That's in a way too much truth for them. Don't tell me I can change because if I can change, that means you're telling me I can change, which means you're telling me I'm going in the wrong direction. And all those things is what God told me when he woke me up on that night when I was heading in the wrong direction. No, listen, we need to become more and more indebted to him. Romans 13, verse 8, a beautiful verse. Romans 13, 8 says, Owe no man anything except to love one another. How's that? Owe no man anything except this, to love one another. And so the debt that we have, we mirror that debt. So church, I hope I can say this. Look, if my words fail me, watch my hands. It's part of being Portuguese. We've got two ways of talking. It's this. Jesus Christ, when he lived in the flesh on earth, was our prototype. Remember that. We are to, you read a moment ago, mimic him. We, we complicate it. Don't make it, com- it's simple. What do you mean? Well, if you know somebody who's caught up in a sin, what are you supposed to do? Mimic Jesus. Now watch how this works. If you know somebody that's caught up in a sin... Do what Jesus would do. 
See, don't do what you want to do. Do what Jesus says to do. Because normally when we, have, when we know somebody who's caught up in a sin, we want to call them up and say, I told you. I knew that would happen to you. Didn't I warn you? Jesus doesn't do that. Jesus reaches out and offers a better way. Jesus offers a more perfect way. You say to them, listen, you don't have to live like this anymore. In church family, look around our world, the world, and take a look at what's going on in the world around us. People need his love like never before. And how many people do we see that might even be, you know, marketing people right now? We're, we know that in our own communities. We, you know, m- most, look, if, if you live in Southern California, if you live in the most poorest community, you're still affluent compared to most of the world. But there are people being trafficked, and you've actually seen them, and you haven't realized it. There are people now that are actually being marketed, trafficked by owners where they put the mom and the kid or two or three at Walmart's parking lot or near the freeway. Have you noticed this though? Uh, I've traveled many places. I would say gypsies. If you've, ever, if you've been to parts of Europe, they're gypsies. But at the end of the day, if you've ever seen this happen, a van pulls up, they immediately break down shop, so to speak. They get in the van, and there's other women and children in the van, and they drive away. Listen, in the near future, we're going to be teaching this church, you, on how to recognize human trafficking. We're going to have this. It's being assembled as we talk. Check this out. Notice that there are signs that they have written down. will always invoke God. And the font is almost always the exact same. And the sign is almost always the exact same way. They just make hundreds of those signs. They they commandeer these poor moms and they pimp them saying, I'm hungry, my babies are hungry. And they're have you seen this happen? You are literally watching a form of human trafficking. When man is not free... On the inside, he enslaves people on the outside. It's tyrannical. But you don't have to go to that extreme. It can happen in a marriage. When somebody's not free in a marriage, they respond out of insecurity. And so they'll control. And that's not God. True biblical Christianity liberates people. We are not to be the ones to judge and to determine. Oh, that magnitude, wait a minute. So wait, you're, you're, a, you're a liar and a thief? Oh, you can be forgiven. Wait, you're a murderer and a, and a, and a prostitute? Oh, that's too far. Oh my goodness, how dare we? When in our minds we have the capability, if we never thought it, of all of those sins. It's powerful. Listen to what Chuck Swindoll said. I've read this in a book by Chuck Swindoll. It's powerful. Where then is our obligation to this salvation? The answer is not complicated, but it is difficult because we, in our religious flesh, I like that, will not surrender control easily. The answer is straightforward enough. We are obligated to do nothing. You don't have to pray. You don't have to get up at 4 a.m. for a quiet time. You don't have to do family devotions. You don't have to give your money. You don't have to take a shower every day. I disagree with that one. Anyway, (laughs) you don't have to obey the Ten Commandments. You don't have to wear dark clothing. You don't have to eat low-fat foods. You don't have to pile up good deeds to become spiritual. If you have the Spirit of Christ in you, you are as spiritual as you're ever going to be. That is powerful. That's a cold, hard look at what Paul is saying. If you're saying, I need to do those things, and then I'm right with God, you're lost. Are you hearing me? You have fallen from the grace of God. You, like the Galatians, have started, you started in the Spirit, but now you have entered into the realm of the flesh.
flesh. You've got legalism going. If you have to, it's wrong. I mean, come on. Again, getting back to that relationship, husband and wife. If you have to, if you have to be intimate, do we have to be intimate? Well, I mean, we're kind of married, you know? But really? I mean, it's part of the deal. You break somebody's heart. Every single one of us desires to be desired. Don't sit there and go, no, that's him. he's not me. Oh, you more than most. It's true. Here's the deal. What you want is love freely given. And when I talk about being in debt and standing in his debt, it's a joy. Oh, yes, Lord. I give all of myself to you. Augustine said, love God and live as you please. Does that sound wrong to you? If it does, you need spiritual eyes and ears. Love God, that's the qualifier. Live as you please. What does that mean? If you love God, you are going to live in a way that blesses God. That's what pleases you. Did you get it? Did you get it? It's simple. Very simple. Billy Graham said, I can choose now as a Christian to live any kind of life I want. And the whole stadium went silent. And he says, I choose to follow Christ. And then the crowds clapped. It's like, we thought. (laughs) But it's, listen, very few people can hear what I'm saying. This is deep stuff. Human nature is, tell me what to do. Draw the line, bring out the whip, make me do it. And then when I do it, give me a badge. You you need to find a, a, a religion. Because God wants relationship. In Galatians chapter 4, we're, this, is a, this, is a, this study is a disaster. Uh, I thought by now we would be way done. Galatians 4.19. My little children, listen how he speaks. For whom I labor in birth again until Christ is formed in you. This is Paul speaking to the church at Galatia. What a beautiful statement. My little children... For whom I labor in birth again. I said, Paul, what are you talking about? Well, listen, he preached to them and they got saved, but then he got goofy. Uh, They got goofy. They started entertaining religion. And then Paul is basically saying, do I have to go through this again with you? Boy, isn't that the life of a parent? How many times have I told you? We're tempted to say, how many times do I have to tell you? Right? And I understand the feeling. We've all said it. We're saying it right now, but it it, it doesn't... It doesn't equate until they see the light bill for themselves. I'm a, I'm a big fan of this. You my, are you kidding? My kid's eight years old. What does he care about the light bill? Is he the one leaving the lights on? Yeah. And here's what you're going to do. Sit him down and show him. I don't know how you bank. Show him online. See the light bill? See, them, see that? See it now? Here's a little. It's both civic lesson and stewardship. Okay, so son, listen. Here's the civics. Ever since Newsom took control, <laughs> that's your civics. Here's Bible. We have to manage what we have wisely. So you see this amount, when you see this amount go up, that means you get to do less. When you see this change, the stewardship, If the kid says, well, I'll have to mitigate that. I got to weigh that out. There'll be some times during the time of the summer. I don't know. I'll No, the kid says, Daddy, I'm sorry. I didn't know that. Now I see that. I love you and I see that it bothers you. I'll I'll make sure the lights are turned off. That would be an answer to prayer. (laughs) Where your little boy's walking around, turn off the lights, everyone. We love Dad so much. But isn't that what you want? 
That's exactly what we want from them. But that word, back to Galatians 4.19, we'll have to end with this. Galatians 4.19, when he says, my little children for whom I labor in birth pains until Christ is formed. That takes us, listen, that's taking us back to Romans 8. Form. The word form here, look at the meaning and we'll end with this. The word form, do you recognize the Greek word? Morpho. Have you ever heard of the word metamorphosis? Meta in Greek is after, morphos, and after change. It means that there was a life and then, and then metamorpho happened. Meta, after. Morph, change. There was a change after the first life. That's what that word means. Change, that there was a life, unchanged, and now you have a life, changed. Metamorpho, and this word morpho is to shape, sculpt. That's what Michelangelo did when you see his work. He looked at the uncut stone, marble, and you know, you can read about him on this. Did you know that he would walk around? I guess it was something to behold. He would walk around at this huge block. Supposedly, David was his greatest achievement. I don't know if you've ever seen uh, David, but he's huge. But the amazing thing is when you're on tour and you're listening to the tour guide tell you is that he walked around this rock. I forget, the, I, I'm gonna forget, I'm, I don't, but it was like a week or a month. He just walked around it and he's looking at it. He's just, and people, what is he going nuts? In one of his sculptures, when he became famous, there's some angel that he did that's spectacular. And somebody asked him, now they knew, they asked him. <laughs> Michelangelo, that's his name, you know. Do you know that? I said his name to my grandson and he said, who? I said, Michelangelo. And he said, who's that? <laughs> and I said, Michelangelo the amazing, he says, his name is Mike Angelo. (laughs) Like Danny DeVito. It was so funny. No, it's it's Michelangelo. It's one word. And boy, talk about a six-year-old and a 65-year-old. Get into it. (laughs) So there's this big block of stone and somebody walks up to Michelangelo and then finally says, Michelangelo, what do you see? And he said, I see an angel trying to get out. Is that awesome? When he looked at that stone to create the greatest work that has ever been done, David, he's looking and looking. And then he grabs a chisel and a mallet. (laughs) Makes the first chip. Back to that word. This is what God is doing in your life. That's why watch. Stay with me. To shape, sculpt, form, mold, chisel, or sand until a desired shape or form is achieved. Paul is saying, Jack is saying, your friends are saying, you are saying to me, I want to see Christ formed in you. That's a church. I don't care how poor you are or how rich you are. I don't care what color you are. I don't care where you live. That's irrelevant. Has the blood of Christ brought us together? Yes. Then for both of us, because we love one another, because he told us to love one another, and he gives us the supernatural power to love one another, even when we don't like each other. It's true. We can love one another, and we start growing. We grow together. We grow closer to him. Christ, listen, is being formed in us. That's why I made a lot of pastors upset. They hate me still to this day. When pastors said, we don't need to open up our church during COVID to be a church. You just need to tune in and be the church. That's impossible. You can tune in and study. We can go through a lesson together, just like you do on Christian radio. Or maybe you watch a sermon on YouTube. You're just learning, which is fine. But it's not church. Why do we need to do church? Because it's hard. Because it's tough. Because it's how Christ is formed in you. When people say things like this, it's my parking spot. Excuse me? 
Now, look. You should be really glad that I'm born again. <laughs> because in my previous life, I would have punched you right now for that. However, the, the real thing is this. It's not your spot. I got here first. And so it's my spot. And you really want it bad, don't you? Yes, I do. Well, just remember this. The first shall be last, but the last shall be first (laughs) in the kingdom. And here's the thing is, how about you and I, I'll take, look, for whatever reason, I got this spot first. Maybe it's God. Maybe God's trying to teach you about how impatient you are. I don't know. But... The same applies for your seat, or for your line, or for your box, or for your... Are you reading me? Because we're in the flesh, we get all possessive about things. But if we love somebody, then we want them to have the spot. So church, let's quietly stand. Could you imagine... Michelangelo with chisel and mallet in hand. And he goes to hit the rock and the rock starts moving. (laughs) Can you imagine? What's he going to... Listen, he's trying to make David. but, But David keeps moving. You ever seen statues where they're missing a nose and an arm? I think they moved. Don't move. Don't just do something. Stand there. Stand still. It's time for you to quit and let God have his way. Father God, in Jesus' name, Lord, we pray right now as a church body. Lord, every day you're getting us ready for heaven. We're like... David locked up in a block of marble and you've been working on us and sanding, I would assume. Many times it hurts. Many times the thought is, what is happening? Why this? Why now? Almighty God, we as a church family, we dedicate our lives to you now that we might be a people who let you have your finished work in our lives. We all collectively, as the body of Christ, proclaim today, Lord, we quit. And we let you take total control. Lord, we are going to stand for the rest of our lives and eternity indebted to you. For your great love wherewith you have loved us. We pray in Jesus' name and all God's people said, Amen. amen. Let's worship in closing. God bless you.